Hey guys, CyberTow back with you with all things chess. Uh, we're going to continue with our series in Isolated Pawns with studying the games of Mikhail Botvinnik. Uh, this is a game he played against Alexander Tolish in uh, 1965. Uh, this is on the tail end of his career. This would be... Let's see... Yeah, this would have been after he lost because uh, he lost his title uh, to Tigran Petrosi in 1963. And then he chose, there were no more rematches and he chose not to play in the candidates. So this would have been after he... Uh, lost his world title and left the world title scene. But even after a few, after he lost his title, uh, he was still a very, very strong grandmaster. Um, honestly, I think Botvinnik really isn't appreciated enough at how strong a player he was um, to hold the title for as long as he did. And there were some legal formalities and rematch clauses that helped him, but he still had to win the matches and to beat Tal in a match and to beat Smyslov in a match. Uh, he drew a match against Smyslov and then beat him um, to draw a match against uh, Bron uh, young Bronstein. Um, he was an extraordinarily strong player, and m most of modern theory was shaped entirely by Mikhail Botvinnik. He was just a completely transformational figure in uh, chess. But just an aside. Uh, Botvinnik was white here, served as C4. He was a... Pretty reliable C4 player. If you're studying the game, if you're studying the English opening, uh, studying the games of Smyslov and Botvinnik all by themselves can mostly get you to play in the English opening competently. Uh, C4, knight f6, knight c3, e6. Um, this is sort of a interesting moment in the game. So d4, uh, head straight for the, the Nimzo Indian. Um, if you're playing the c4 opening to try to stay within the English opening, very interesting here would be e4. Uh, this is called the Mechanus attack. Um, I play this a lot as white, and in my opinion, it's perfectly fine. Black's two main moves would be d5, and then just an example of what the sort of position you get. Uh, you get sort of a hanging pawn structure, but in exchange, you get quite a bit of activity for your pieces, and Black's light square bishop is a little bit clogged up. Or the other main line is c6, and White sacrifices a pawn, um, but he's going to get a Black Star Square Bishop after Knight d6 check. Uh, he has a little bit more space, and generally Black tends to fall behind development here. Um, so if you're if you're looking to stay within the English opening here, uh, give the Mechanus attack a try. It's still fairly low in theory. Um, it's very aggressive. The English opening has the a reputation of being sort of a passive opening. Uh, to the contrary, if you're looking for a fight, the English opening has a lot more option, options for a full-fledged battle than e4 or d4 these days. Um, but by having played d4, just went straight for the Nimzo. Bishop e4. E3, the Rubenstein, this is probably White's most solid option uh, to face the Nimzo. Uh, C5, this is sort of, dis not necessarily disappeared, but it's sort of discouraged, uh, especially by White's response in this game. Uh, other responses, D5, just an aside, uh, D5 really is almost a full-out positional error here for this exact line. A3 here, I should take And this particular line is just a, a supercharged a sameish line for white. Um, basically, d5 gives up black's bishop pair in unfavorable circumstances, because this was almost more or less a forced line. Uh, white's able to get rid of his double pawns, and he develops his knight to e2, so he can still play f3 to support a central push. Uh, this is a very favorable position for White. This scores very well. Um, if, if you're looking for a classic game to look at, uh, Botvinnik Capablanca, Avro 1938, has this position. This is sort of the foundational game for this line, improving how strong this was for White. Um, castles, that's the main move for top professionals now. It's the most solid move. It's a move I play when I play the Nimzo. Um, it's certainly the most reliable. B6 is the most interesting. It's sort of a full-on hypermodern choice. Uh, Black's either going to play bishop b7 to help fight for the e4 square, or bishop a6 and try to attack the pawn on c4. Uh, both are seen quite a bit from this line. So, uh, Castles or b6, in my opinion, are the most interesting. c5, it's not seen a lot due to knight g2, or 
yeah, knight g2 here. Well, knight e2, because the other knight can't move. Um, but knight e2 here. Um, this prevents black from doubling white's pawns, which is the major threat in the Nimzo. Um, and it does in a situation where after c5, if the bishop takes, <coughs> after the knight takes back, that's a c pawn is going to be hanging. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, d5 was played in the game. A3. So from this position, suddenly the c5 pawn is hanging. So black hasn't gotten any double pawns to attack out of it, and he's liquidating those pawns to begin with, so what is he getting for giving up the bishop pair? Um, and the answer is, in this particular line, not so much. White scores very well in this line. Um, c5 has really gone under due to 92. Um, but c takes, and now we reach the familiar isolated pawn. Bishop takes, knight c6, bishop e3, castle. Um, compared to some of our other isolated pawns that we studied, this is a pretty favorable version for white. Uh, white's got the bishop pair. That is always an asset. Uh, he's already got a3 included, which gives the bishop a useful hidey hole back into a2. And also d5 isn't particu particularly well guarded. So if white decides to play d5 to completely open the position for his bishop pair, he has that as a positional threat. So this is a very favorable position for white. This scores very well. Uh, b6 was played. He needs to uh, somehow get his light square bishop into the game. Queen d3, this isn't the most accurate. Modern theory leans towards queen f3. And then bishop d3. And th this is pretty darn comfortable for white. White can continue with queen h3. And then moves like bishop g5. Or develop both rooks to the d and e file. Um, this is a very comfy position for white. This scores very well. Uh, but queen d3 isn't as accurate. Bishop b7. Okay, d1. Knight e7. h6 would be a bit more accurate. In some cases, bishop g g5 can be a positional threat. Because there's no way to break the pin. So stopping the pin in the first place can prevent a lot of positional angst on uh, black's parts. Uh, but knight e7, it's not terrible, just a little bit inaccurate. Bishop g5, knight g6. Now this is inaccurate. Uh, this provides an immediate target for white's attack that should look familiar if you watched the previous video. Uh, black should absolutely play knight f d5. And if, a black, if white tries to gain something by liquidating, this is just an example line, but let's say... This is the line he chose. Uh, this is less than nothing for white. Uh, black could easily steer this towards a uh, knight versus a bad bishop. I say bad bishop because the one central pawn is on the color of the bishop that he has left. Um, black could very easily steer this towards a knight versus ba a bad bishop in the game. Um, but knight g6 is a clear error. And it's an error for tactical reasons. First off, because white has a specific move available to him. And that move is f4. Um, this perfectly takes advantage of everything in black's position. So the bishop on c4 is completely unopposed. It's ready to be unleashed down to the king on g8. Uh, that's, a, that's a point in favor of playing f4, to unleash the power of that bishop a little bit farther. Um, the knight on f6 is pinned. So opening the f file would pressure that knight on f6 even more. That's another point in favor of the knight on g6 just moved to g6. f5 would hit it with tempo. That's another point in favor of playing f4. Um, these concrete variables are all in favor of playing f4, which in general can be a, a desirable positional move to begin with when you still have that bishop on the a2 to g8 diagonal. And let's make clear, that is one of the factors in favor of playing f4. If the bishop were on c2, there would be a lot less positional uh, sense in playing f4 because it's not opening up the game for that strong light squared bishop. Uh, but here, every every factor in the position sort of screams towards white playing f4, so Botvinnik goes ahead with this plan. h6 is more or less forced, just a quick line. Uh, he could play knight e7 to try to stop f5, but this is very passive and it gets forced through anyways eventually. Uh, queen h3, very strong move points at h7 and e6. d5. And then f5 just gets played anyways. Um, and white, white is bursting through. This is on the verge for black. It's not a winning by force just yet, but this is a very strong attack for white. Uh, but h6, f5, ef, bishop takes, then rook xf5. 
Uh, this is a dangerous position, but actually Talish defends this very well. Knight f4 is probably the best move. Queen c6 is another option, but that's for the notes if you want to look at it. And then the next five or six moves are basically all by force. So the rook takes, uh, knight takes. The rook on f6 doesn't have a, really a safe retreat square in the f-file. And rook d6 would get hit with knight xb2 forking the bishop and the uh, rook. So white's basically forced into playing rook xf7. Uh, if the rook takes, just rook xd3. And then the bishop will take back on f7 and basically uh, white will just be up a pawn. So rook xb2, rook takes, double check, so the king has to take back, rook f1. And this is more or less all forced from uh, the original, from this point back here, knight f4. Um, this is a superior endgame for white. Now this is a little bit of feel from uh, the topic of uh, isolated queen pawns, so I'll just briefly go over these moves. Uh, but I will detail some of the logic here, but this is a favorable endgame for white. Uh, each of white pieces, white's pieces are better than their black counterpart. The knight, uh, the knight in b2 really isn't all that well posted. Uh, the bishop on e6 is definitely better than the bishop on b7. And then the rook on f1 is more mobilized than the rook on a8. The d-pawn is an asset for white. Uh, it is a pass pawn in basically any endgame that is an asset. Um, so this is a favorable endgame for white. Black has drawing chances here. So rook d8, d5, not the best move, but uh, bishop c8. Rook goes to the 7th. This is all very logical. D takes. Rook D6. Not the most... Um, not the toughest move. Uh, A6 would be a little bit tougher. And black can still get this line uh, one move later, but just as a forced line to show. Rook D6. And black is temporary, temporarily two pawns down. Um, but the pawn in a3 is absolutely going to fall. The e pawn is basically black's deep whenever he wants it. Um, but the main thing is the a pawn. Once the a3 pawn is captured by black, the a black's a and b pawns are actually farther along than uh, white's g and h pawns. And the queen side pawns will be harder to start to stop because black's king is already in the vicinity of the king side. White's king is already all the way over in g1. It's nowhere near the queen side. So if it turns into a queening race, that might actually favor black. Um, so this is absolutely a crazy position. It should still be a little bit better for white, um, but it's a much better choice than what we see in the game. Because what we see in the game, Talos just gets ground down by the next technique. Uh, so rook d6. Rook takes rook xc6. This is another chance to play that previous line, uh, and that'd be a much better choice. As it is in the game... <coughs> 93, 93, 94. And this this is a truly cheerless thing for black. Hold on, let me have some scotch. Scotch and chess go together very nicely. Um, this is a very cheerless end game for uh, for uh, black. Uh, black's upon down. He has two weaknesses on b6 and h6. Basically, white's goal here. He's going to tie black down to guarding the weak b-pawn and then take his king over to the king's side to attack the weak h-pawn. Um, this is known as, as the principle of two weaknesses. It's never enough to just attack one weakness. You want to be attacking two weaknesses, preferably on different sides of the board, uh, to overstrain your opponent's defenses. So white has a clear plan of attack here. This is a really uh, cheerless endgame for black. Uh, rook a7, this is actually uh, a mistake, and it's surprising to say this is a mistake, because according to endgame principles, moving your rook to the 7th rank is incredibly strong, but here, attacking the weak pawn is more important, and then with king f2, white's ready to start that journey to in front of the h pawn. Um, and this is either winning or on the verge of winning for white. This should be a very difficult endgame for black to hold. Uh, but rook, rook a7 actually gives black some chances. On rook e5, this allows black a little bit more active in, of a defense. And then he can also move his pawn to h5, and that sort of prevents uh, white's king from penetrating uh, later. Um, but black chose king f8, and here white just retains control of the position. 
Uh, rook f6 is a clear error. He wants to play rook c6 because on king g3, then suddenly rook c3 wins the pawn on a3, uh, and then two versus one on the king side should be a draw. Uh, but rook f6 just drives the white king where it wants to go to begin with. King f3. Uh, h5 is a little bit better try because it takes away the g4 square, so the white king has to choose a, a different path to penetrate. Uh, but king g8, g3, king g4, and now the white king just penetrates. Uh, and this this truly is going for black, so I'll just show the remaining moves just to uh, show them. And then black resigned before white could uh, play another move, but th this well is well and truly gone. Um... So, really, the, the key moments were back here. Um, knight g6 was a clear error, and f4 it was sort of perfectly tailored to take advantage of it. Uh, much superior would have been knight fd5. Uh, and a lot of these isolated pawn positions, we see that knight fd5 is a superior choice, um, either to challenge the bishop on g5, or here, um, to avoid having an ugly pin on knight on f6. But knight f d5 is a superior choice. After that, f4, almost led by force to just a very ugly endgame for black, which um, defending passive endgames is always difficult. Uh, so it's not really surprising that Talish went under, especially since Botvinnik was one of the greatest endgame technicians of all time. In my opinion, just behind Smyslov and probably Kramnik. Um, so another interesting game. I'm, as usual, I'll list the PGN file in the comments. Uh, my name is Cybertel, and we will see you next time.